Welcome to Shortfield, a channel all about the lighter side of aviation. And this time we're asking the question, is it practical to use a modern desktop flight simulator as a planning tool for real world aviation? And does it bring any benefits? So buckle up because here we go. If you haven't used the desktop flight simulator for a few years, your memories may be of something like this. And if they are, well, I have some great news for you. Things have changed, just a little bit. Since those early days of flight, desktop flight simulators, things have come a very long way. And the latest versions include modern aircraft with accurate flight models, super realistic real-time weather, and ultra high resolution satellite based scenery with lifelike 3D ground clutter and obstacles. You'd be forgiven to think that some of the imagery produced from these was actually taken in the real world. The aviation industry has been using simulators for years and are now at the point where a majority of a pilot's type ratings can be done in them. They are also used to familiarise pilots with new airfields and approaches. Desktop flight simulators do get used for light aircraft system familiarisation and for instrument practice, for which they add a lot of benefit. But, are we at a point where it's feasible for us private pilots to use the sims as part of our familiarisation and real world pre-planning when visiting new airfields and strips? Can they really give us the feel of actually doing an approach and landing, and how well do they compare to real life? Today we're going to look and compare two airfields using Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 with the latest updates to May 2021, including the default UK scenery, SAR Ultra and the modern flight model option selected. And we're going to compare those with their real world counterparts. Unfortunately, we can't use the same aircraft, but we've opted for a Diamond DA20 for the sim and the trusty Piper Sport for the real world. So let's see how they compare. Nut Hampstead is a small private strip set in the Hertfordshire countryside, just 10 miles to the northwest of the busy airport of London Stansted, and was once home to the 398th US Bomber Group during World War II. Today, just a 700 metre or 2,300 foot grass strip remains, with a rather nasty concrete slab splitting the field in two. Starting in the sim, you join us in the overhead for runway 23, which is 460 feet above sea level. It's a left-hand circuit, so our descent starts to the northwest of the field, where we drop down from 2,300 feet, noting that we have controlled airspace above us at 2,500 feet, to 1,400 feet on the dead side, which makes our circuit height above the airfield 940 feet. There's a 120-foot mast marked on the chart, but is not depicted in the sim. Everything else from this altitude looks very realistic. I've never flown the DA-20 in real life, but it seems a bit underpowered in the sim and very twitchy in pitch, but that's probably something that can be adjusted in the settings. Going through the crosswind leg, we fly over the Barkway VOR, which is depicted in the scenery, but just as a ground image, not as a 3D model. The trees look good, and the wooded area to the south of the field seems exactly like it is in the real world. As we approach the end of the downward leg, we try to avoid overflying all the little houses and hamlets which look realistically rendered. Turning final, we select full flap and line up with the runway. In real life, I like to fly through the gap between the tree on the right which has been modelled and the bushes on the left which somehow do not look correct. It's at this point of short final in real life that you realise that runway 23 has a marked upslope, but this is missing from the sim. We touch down and in real life try to stop before the concrete slab, situated at 280 metres or 900 feet from the threshold, as it is not good ground to run your aircraft over. The sim seems to offer the same level of braking performance and we've stopped before the concrete. Turning 180 we head back to where the hangar and caravan are in real life, but the, this appears to have been replaced with an office block. Still, this is default scenery and I'm sure a scenery cre creator could fix this easily. Okay, so that's the sim. Let's take a look at the same approach in real life for comparison. Just like in the sim, we are on a crosswind passing over the Barkway VOR. 
looking right in case any unannounced traffic is joining on a downwind leg. After a good check, we turn to establish ourselves on downwind, looking left and tracking the runway and it all seems remarkably similar to the sim. We do our downwind checks, have a good look right in case anyone decides to join on a base leg and with all clear we turn left onto base and start reducing speed and altitude. Turning onto final, the picture out of the window looks exactly as it did in the sim and I would feel a real sense of familiarity had I not been here before and only visited in the simulator. As we close in on short final you can see the marked upslope missing in the sim but the tree on the right looks good although the bushes to the left were not well modelled in the sim. We touch down and stop before the concrete intersection and turn towards the hangar and caravan. I would definitely have found a sim visit as part of my pre-planning very helpful here. So that's Nut Hampstead. Let's take a look at another airfield. Little Granston has been in operation since 1966 and it is set in the grounds of a farm in the pleasant Bedfordshire countryside. The airfield has a main runway orientated 2810 at 810 metres or 2650 feet long and a shorter cross runway designated 0321 at 430 metres or just over 1400 feet long. Both are grass. Ok so we're in the sim and joining on the left hand downwind leg for runway 28. The pattern is tight for this runway as the glider site at Granston Lodge has its runway 22 departure end just a nautical mile from the 28 threshold and in real life you often see glider tugs very near to the Little Granston circuit at low level. Looking out the left wing we track the runway at 1050 feet and everything looks very convincing. As we turn a close in base leg we start our descent looking for traffic and keeping a watchful eye on the glider site to our right. The turn onto final looks very realistic and we select a touchdown point after the cross runway just in case someone decides to taxi out. As we touch down with lots of runway left it feels very real, even the grass seems around the right height. We apply the brakes and slowly bring the aircraft to a stop. Then vacate the runway to our left and taxi to the clubhouse to pay our virtual landing fee. Right, let's jump into the real thing and do it again. We join on the downwind leg and looking left we can see the runway and airfield buildings looking exactly like their simulated recreation. As we turn onto base in a descending left turn we reduce the power and take a good look out towards the glider site and the final approach. The whole scenario looks ex almost exactly as it did in the sim except this is real life. Turning final and again the scene is almost exactly the same as the sim had modelled it. We check for other traffic taxiing out from the parking area and aim for a point to land after the cross runway intersection. As we turn off the runway and head back to the clubhouse, I honestly think the simulator had it spot on. So, in conclusion, 
Although we only tried two airfields, they both offered a good level of detail and matched their real world counterparts incredibly well. But then that is to be expected considering the scenery is based on satellite imagery. The 3D parts such as trees and ground elements were also very realistic and the visual model comes over as completely convincing. However, there were a few subtle things that were missing such as the 120 foot mast situated on the field at Nut Hampstead along with the steep upslope at the beginning of Nut Hampstead Runway 23 and the trees in general looked a little bit too big. There was also a general lack of feel and of the aircraft interacting with the air and the environment. For example, in real life flying when relatively low over a wooded area in any wind you would often get light turbulence and if there was no wind you would usually get some sink. Field crops and shades also affect the thermals in different ways which was also missing and all this led to a flying on rails sort of feeling with the aircraft model, although others may be better. Overall I would say a good desktop flight simulator on a decent computer is an excellent tool for practicing the pattern and getting to grips with the topography around the field. There are also lots of great upgrades and add-ons that address many of the deficiencies of the default scenery and flying the sim is after all excellent fun. So that does it for this episode. Flight simulators have come a very long way and I can't wait to see where they go in future. They should definitely have a place in the private pilot tool bag. Do you use a desktop flight simulator and if so which one and do you use it just for fun or do you use it to help in your real world flying? I'd love to hear from you, please pop any comments in the section below and I read every one. Thank you so much for watching and if you'd like to see more videos like this please consider subscribing and hit that notification bell so I can let you know next time I upload a video. Hopefully you found this video helpful, fly safe guys but remember I am not an instructor, it is all based on my personal experience as a private pilot in the UK. Other countries may have different rules or requirements, so always consult your local procedures. Short field out.